Hello everyone, today we are going to do a run through of the first community challenge for the pony racing. So the way this is going to work is that I'm going to try to solve this uh, challenge and um, as help to do this I have Bob with me. Hello. So basically Bob knows everything about this challenge, he made it and I know um, a little bit about this challenge but but I have not solved it previously I've not attempted to solve it previously I've just you know seen the occasional bit out of it so I'm going into this uh, kind of blind and we're gonna guide you through the process of this challenge like what the bug is how you exploit it and so on until we finally have a working exploit at the end so uh, we're going to start by looking at what we have here. So we have our uh, challenge binary, which is a 64-bit uh, uh, elf binary. So we're going to start with just open it in IDA to just have a you know quick overview um, what it looks like and so basically uh, the setup here is that you know we uh, are using ida for the analysis and then we'll write uh, you know a python script to do the exploit and there will be some debugging uh, and stuff and for kind of like explaining and guiding you through these uh, this challenge um bob has been kind enough to to prepare some uh slides uh, where we're gonna look at this so just first like just a quick look through this uh challenge there is uh, a main function here which if we decompile it um you know it's a fairly short function there is uh, some initial setup here uh some kind of uh while loop uh, and another for loop down here where we have some kind of function call uh, being made and uh, I think that's about it for just uh, you know looking at it here and uh, you know to get the more clearer overview of the challenge um, you know Bob will guide you through basically the structure of this uh, program so right so first of all we always look at the protections first uh, and in this case we have a 64-bit elf, as mentioned before, full railroad, is a stack canary, uh, NX is enabled, and it is a Pi binary. So all of the protections are turned on by default. So the application purpose is basically a function, uh, a series of functions that can be called in any order from your input. So you feed input into the application, and then one of these functions in this array that you're seeing will be called. But the problem is they're really all just junk functions. They don't do much. You can see random printf freeing random memory. It's just nonsense, basically, except this one. And that's because obviously it's using the system function to execute a system command, but the function that the function doesn't actually uh, execute anything worthwhile, so it's not really that useful. So how does this all fit together? First, we have a little block of code that will read from the standard in, and then it will iterate through that input splitting it into 16 byte chunks and then grabbing a CRC32 for each of those chunks. And at that point, it's calling one of the functions. You can see using the result of an absolute function and then the modulus of 15. So it's just picking one of those functions out of that array and then passing your input to that. So there is some debug functionality. Uh, if you add the D switch to the command line, it will dump a little bit of uh, the input. 
So that's obviously stored on the stack. But this is not turned on on the remote server. And it might be helpful later, obviously. Yeah, so if we look at this in the, like, kind of like, uh, try to match what Bob just said um, in this uh, program. First of all, we have this uh, debug uh, flag thing being set here, I guess. And uh, here we're also printing out so this is some um, formatting, but basically printing out uh, the, which attempt we're doing. So I'm reading some input here. And um, here, this um, function is then being called. So this is done uh, a couple of times. And then the yeah, program exits. So we can see if we, yeah, if we run it, it will look something like this. And um, you can input some, some data, you can do it again. It will, this time it will, this time this, the, it, it called the function to print this out and you can do it another time. Um, and this time you actually managed to to call that uh, that system uh, the system function there, but yeah, as as Bob said, the, there is no such program, so it doesn't really help you with anything. So let's um, look at just starting to do some um, you know further analysis of this code to kind of like start naming some things and to get a better overview. So this is the main function, as I said. Uh, here we just have the uh, stack cookie, which is being initialized here and then verified before the end of the uh, program. We have, um, this is then the, um, uh, this debug flag that we're fetching. So, Either um, it will be found, and then it's you know compared to see if it's it's D or um, if it's not found, we'll just break. So basically, this variable here um, should be kind of like the uh, the thing that actually says if if we are in the debug mode or not. Um, so this is good, and then we have a good understanding of this um, initial part here. And then we go into this for loop, and this will count the number of attempts that we're doing. So this... Um, counter here is basically like we could just leave it as i but i used to be i i like to be clear like what we are i mean in this case there is basically only one loop so it should be obvious but you know if you have multiple loops it's good to, it's good to name like what are we actually like uh looping so um if we look at this read input function then um it uh you know here we do the actual reading from standard input. Um, we're like checking the length of this, uh, clearing some memory down here. Here we calculate the CRC32 as was explained previously. And this is also stored in this um, uh, array here. And here's the uh, you know thing related to the debug and dumping stuff. So um, you should try to figure out, you know, exactly how the things are, uh, you know, related to each other uh, here. So, um, if we look at this input array, it's a one kilobyte 
um, global variable for the input, uh, and we are passing this uh, thing in as well as like a, a pointer that can be set by the um, read input function. So with these, now, now we know what's going in on this side, we can name them on this side of the function. So let's call this the like this debug. This is, I guess, like the destination buffer where we're writing. And this is um, a pointer to the length of the um, data, I guess. So here we can see this is just like copying it onto the stack. So we can make those an alias of each other. Here we do like reading into the destination. Um, so we, we're reading something in here and here it's basically checking if the last character character that we read is a new line, um, we set it to a null byte. So we terminate the string there and remove the, um, the new line. Then we check the input, the length of it. And let's see. So this means that if we like, if the length is zero, we just return that. And then there's this uh, array here, which we clear. So this is uh, it's an array with sixty-four uh, entries. Um, so. Since they are all uh, four byte values, 64 out of them, that makes 256 bytes. So we're just clearing this whole thing. And then basically, this thing is, um, is it calculating the, uh, So we take okay. So this works in like increments of sixteen. And calculates. Um, so. Yeah, so we have this CRC32 function, which takes a couple of arguments. So we should look up what those arguments are. If we, oh, okay, so it's the uh, probably the the libc. Okay, here we have it. So. Okay, so it takes an existing uh, starting checksum, a pointer to a buffer and a length uh, of that buffer and returns the new um, checksum. So if we go back here, um, we have just uh, start checksum, the buffer, the length so yeah so the length here will then basically just be up to 16 like we check uh, we check the length of the whole thing we subtract you know how far we have come um, and that means that we're taking kind of like a block up to 16 uh, characters calculating calculating the CRC for this and then we are assigning this 
into this um, array. So we can call this uh, like the offset then, I guess. And this could be like the block index. Um, and then finally, if the debug flag is positive, we will call this dump function and the dump function uh, looks like it will do some kind of, you know, it will print out data based on this um, this buffer and the length, I guess. And then also return how much we read. So this is the, this will return how much data we read. Uh, and if we read anything, we will um, again go in increments of 16 bytes and again have kind of like a block index counter here. So take out that um, the CRC we calculated, uh, take the absolute value of that, uh, module 15, uh, index into this function array, and then call that with the um, input as an argument. And that's basically a full disassembly of this. So if we're looking at the um, uh, bugs in this um, thing, then uh, I guess like whenever you see something like this, um, you should um, take care. This is um, yeah, something that we will explain uh, how this can result in a bug. And then also, um, so Bob, the other bug in this program, can we, where do we have that? Well, remember the debug flag is interesting since it's being passed as a pointer. Oh yeah, so the debug flag here is on the stack. It's being, oh, it's, this is interesting. So here the debug flag is um, a 32 bit uh, value we can look where it's actually assigned here uh, and then here we are for some reason uh the the like the decompilation here is saying that this is a pointer to uh to a 64 bit value. So why is this? That probably means it's like something inside here. If we look here at the debug flag, it's used down here. So um, let's see where that is then. Oh, so here it's being dereferenced as a 64 bit value. So that's going to cause some issues. So right. yeah, Bob, if you can just explain this. Absolutely. So you were right. Obviously there is a casting error on that debug flag, which is caused because like you said, it is a 32 bit value stored on the stack next to the fails counter. Um, and obviously you can increment the fails counter if uh, no data was read. 
So the problem there is really obvious here when it's outside of the decompiler. You can see it's being used as a, a large pointer. So what this effectively means is, is that if the fail counter is incremented, then this value that debug is, is going to be above zero, which means you're going to be able to switch on the uh, dump function. Yes. And then we have the other um, bug. A beautiful bug. The Blankian paradox. Uh, so obviously there's a bunch of reasons why you could have seen this because whenever you see function pointers being used, that's obviously very suspicious. But this is a beautiful bug. It's a compiler bug. It's a logic bug. And it's one of those bugs that if it wasn't used in this way, you might have just skipped right over it because it just looks so innocuous. Everyday programmers could use this and never know what it's doing. So this code where we take a function and we're passing a value through uh, abs, which is to get the absolute value, compiles into this, these basic three instructions. So why isn't there a call to abs as a function? Well, obviously abs is uh, an automatic built-in in GCC, which means that the it's used sort of as a macro and it'll just be injected into the code. Um, it's automatic. So even if there's no optimization, this will happen. There's a bunch of these functions. Uh, and so in order to disable, you have to use that option that's on your screen. So it's quite a clever optimization that originates in the seventies. You can see it in all sorts of assembler books, uh, about different tricks. And it really is quite clever. So the first instruction will sign extend EAX to EDX. So this just means that if EAX is positive, then EDX will be zero. If it's negative, then we flip all the bits on in EDX, which is the same as minus one. So, uh, then we XOR these two values together, which obviously again means that if EAX, uh, if EDX was zero because EDX, EAX was positive, uh, then it'll just stay the same, but if it isn't, then it won't. And then we subtract these two. So again, the logic is if EAX was larger than zero, EDX will still be zero. If EAX was smaller than zero, then remember that EDX will be F, 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 F. And, uh, this will handle both cases. A positive number can go through these three instructions. And, uh, so seven will still end up as seven out the other end, but minus seven will end up as seven out the other end because of the magic of two's complements. Uh, it's quite clever. It's almost perfect. Almost. So what's wrong with it? Well, there's always one edge case. And in this case, it is int min, which is 80, 0, 0, 0, 0 in hex, which is a value you should know about. And intuitively, the reason this fails is because if you think about it, there's one more negative number in the range, in the time, in the number line from the int min all the way through to int max, there has to be slightly more on one side than the other because zero takes up one of those slots and there has to be an even number of uh, numbers that can be represented in a 32-bit uh, space. All right, so let's show how this works when we break it. So in this example, EAX is int min, which means we sign extend and that means EDX will be FFFFF or minus one. So when we XOR, that means that obviously the result is seven FFFFF, which is the largest positive number that you can get in a signed 32 bit integer. So here's the interesting bit. When we do the operation to subtract EDX from EAX, we end up back 
at the original number, which was int min, which is the smallest possible number we could have had. So effectively, abs with int min with a mod of 15 equals minus 8. So somehow, a negative number has survived through this abs fake call. So EAX is negative, which is bad. And it's the most negative number it could possibly be, which is even worse. So how could you have known this? Obviously, you can always catalog a bunch of tricks in your mind. But I mean, how do people obtain this information without being told explicitly? Well, you could read books. The, a great one is The Art of Software Security Assessment, which deals with the how to find bugs and how to think about bugs as you're progressing. So I would definitely recommend that. That's obviously a skill that uh, is of, often overlooked. Uh, always read source code. This isn't new to the developers. Sometimes it seems like developers are idiots because there's these mistakes, but really they're just balancing constraints. You know, sometimes performance has to outweigh some risk and, uh, you can always find those decisions in the test cases. In this case, there's a file pc37078.c in GCC. There's mailing lists around GCC. There are other discussions in test cases. So you can always find these bugs there because there are more. We're just covering one. And then obviously the Zeta approach, which is just try everything, do a little dynamic analysis. He, he probably, when he would approach this problem, he's going to chuck int max at it, zero, int min, maybe some characters. So the idea there is to break it with a little manual fuzzing or maybe real fuzzing. And then the important part is asking why and getting to a root cause analysis. Nice. So uh, let's look at how we are actually going to exploit this then so with this um this in mind uh, that means that if we look at this uh, call here then as we said we know that this um calculation here we can either get it to be um something from 0 to um 14 by inputting nice stuff or we can get it to be minus eight, right? Yep. Which, absolutely. if we look here, um, that would put us. Um, let's look at the addresses here. You see that this that would put this back in uh, the input area here. So, starting at this offset. Uh, index minus eight and the pointers are uh, keywords because we're on 64 bit so uh, eight bytes times eight so we would go 64 bytes back and end up inside the input buffer so basically we would index into the input buffer use that as a function pointer and then call this with um our input as an argument so um that means that we if we knew where because there is a system um let's look at these uh all these crazy function we knew that one of them contained a call to the system function. So if we knew where this function was located, we could put the address of that function in an appropriate position in our input so that when this indexes into that input, it will take out the pointer to the system function and call it with a string argument that we fully control. So we could call the system function with something that we control. Uh, and that would be game over. Uh, but as we talked about previously, as, as Bob explained, this, this, uh, 
uh, challenge has all the uh, all the protections uh, turned on, which means that that includes uh, a PI, a position independent executable. So that means that um, the address space is randomized, and we do not know where the this call to or the system function is uh, located. And this is where the uh, the second bug comes in. So by turning on the debug function here, uh, we could hopefully then leak some memory, which would include some address uh, inside the memory space of of the program, which would allow us to calculate the base uh, of the program, which in turn would allow us to calculate the location of, of the system function. So, um, yeah, maybe uh, Bob, if you want to kind of like, you know, structure this attack plan then. Yes. So how do we attack this? Well, if we increment that fail counter to take advantage of the casting bug, we get to turn debugging on, which is obviously the way that we're going to get that leak. So we can provide just a, an empty line, just a new line that will get eaten up uh, when it gets trimmed because the new lines are trimmed, which means that the input length is zero. So that increments the fail counter. We can write the 1024 bytes to leak the function pointers at the bottom of that array because the input squishes against that. And obviously we can use that debug as Zeta told before, uh, in order to find the location of system by leaking a PI address. Then if we put that system pointer in the exact right spot, which is minus eight uh, 64 bit integers before the function pointers, then once we write a string that passes the CRC check to equal int min, uh, it's going to execute system with a valid shell command. So the big problem is how do we get CRC 32 to return that exact value? Well, there's two ways really. You could just brute force it. It's really small entropy. It's not that big of a deal. You just add four bytes to any string you want uh, and just, you know, iterate through a random sets and you'll hit it eventually. And then of course is the smart approach, which is that CRC is pretty influenceable uh, by manipulating the last four bytes. This is a well-known thing and there are ready-made tools like force 32 that will do it in a more uh, methodical manner. Great, so let's uh, try this out then. I have here my editor. Um, I'm going to start by just uh, writing a um, exploit for this. So I'm going to use the Pwn Tools uh, library, which is a very nice, you know, library framework for writing uh, exploits and um, as we said, if we try running the challenge, we the first thing we want to do is just to know, just to make this uh, nice and clean, is that we are going to wait until we actually uh, get the prompt to um, input stuff. And then, as we said, we are going to provide just an empty um, input because then when you know that means we turn on the debugging so in our script we're just gonna do an empty send line call to just send an empty line so this is like uh, pass one to turn on the debugging and then we're going to wait to be prompted again. It's still uh, going to be attempt one out of three. And then uh, if we look at back at our 
attack plan, uh, we will then provide a full kilobyte of uh, data. So this is our payload. And then if just if we look at what's happening in here, then just to make that really clear, um, we will be reading uh, we will be reading this into the buffer and it will not be um, cut off here so that when we out put this or wait um, this oh yeah so when it's when it's uh, dumped again we're gonna get some extra data um, at the end then which is gonna be um, the contents of this function uh, array or at least one of these addresses and then we can use this to um, calculate things. So we're going to send uh, this payload. So we're going to leak um, a function pointer and let's see what this looks like when we run it so you see here that um, here it outputs all the stuff that we uh, input but here there's some extra bytes at the end which should be our um, uh, one of these function pointers, and it it looks reasonable because I mean we are uh, on a sixty four bit bit uh, uh, architecture, so uh, but we're I mean the memory space typically doesn't use the full sixty four bits, so a pointer like a function pointer will typically since it's little endian it will typically be uh six bytes of data and there is basically two null bytes here but the string of course uh, cuts off at the null byte so we'll just have to pre pretend that these are here so to you know make the interaction here a little bit simpler to like find our way in this uh, leak we're just gonna add like a different marker for the last line for example we could do then uh we add or maybe just for the last character. So we add, uh, instead of an A, we do an X at the end. So if you run that, you see we have an X here. Maybe we should have a few characters actually so that there is no you know, mess up. We do like four Xs and then we can use that as kind of like a marker for the interaction. So basically what we do is after we've sent this, um, we're gonna do this receive line contains. So we receive until we receive a line that is containing this XXX. And then we know that the next line that we're receiving is the leak. Um, and we're just gonna confirm that. So you have here what I called uh, the raw leak. Um, we'll do some, you know, cleaning up on this. Um, just strip and yeah. So now I think we just got unlock unlucky. Yeah. So if we're unlucky and one of these. Uh, bytes uh, is a null byte then we will not get the full uh, leak but then we'll just we can just rerun it that's you know one in 256 and there's a couple of those so uh, well what we can do here is just take this many bytes um, which is 17 bytes and then we strip out the spaces 
Um, so actually, we will. Uh, so now we have the bytes like this, um, and we can uh, just add those null bytes at the end. So now we have something here that can looks looks like a, um, a function pointer, and um, what we need to do now is just um, hex decode this um, so we have these hex bytes and then um, we will unpack this as a 64-bit value um, and then we can make sure that this looks fine. So we have something here that looks plausible. So let's actually look at this, you know, compare it uh, in the debugger to make sure that this is all fine. So I'm starting the process here, and this is why I had this uh, pause up here. So now we're starting the uh, program, and we're running uh, GDB in this other window, and we'll just um, check the memory layout, and we see that um, the code is loaded at this uh, base address. And if we just uh, continue and run, we get this leaked pointer. And if you check here, you see that this prefix here is the same as this here. So that means um, it's the correct uh, leak. Uh, hopefully, we'll just need to make sure that this offset matches as well. So this should be this first element in the array. So let's, um, where is this? Oh yeah, so there's a function here where it populates um, the array. So we have this function is the first one, which is located at this offset. So let's put that in code. So like uh, dummy func offset, is the C95. And then the leaked pointer will give us the um, base address, which is the leaked pointer minus the dummy func offset. We can just print that out as well. And have something here like it looks like a base address and then we calculate the address of system um, so we have a call to system uh, yeah we can do I mean we can do it either here or uh, this one doesn't really matter um, let's take this one so we just write that system offset is this a70 and then is the system address is the base address plus the system offset okay so now we have used this memory leak to calculate the address uh, of system so um, now we need to calculate where in the input we should put this address and um, so that would be, as we said, it's the full, like the full size of the uh, buffer minus eight times eight because it's a 64 bit architecture. So this is the location where we should put the uh, system. So let's build this 
a second payload, which is going to be just some padding. And then we pack this system address. And then we wait until we get attempt number two this time. And we send this uh, payload to the program. So so far we 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 haven't been concerned with the uh, with the argument to system, but that's very easy to sort um, afterwards. But we do, however, need to sort. We need to fix uh, the indexing. Um, so the, the the value that gives the the CRC value. So basically, um, as we said before, like it reads the input, it cuts it up into sixteen byte chunks, calculates the CRC for that chunk, and then also uses that chunk as an argument. So we could, for example, then decide. So so basically, this this we we're gonna have to create a 16 16 byte block which will both be the argument to the function but also uh, make sure that the CRC that is calculated is this uh, value so we can then put this uh, let's restructure this a little bit just put it in some uh, lines so we're gonna add something here and then we're finally gonna add um, the padding and then the pointer. So now we're just missing this part. Uh, that is the string that gives us the right um, indexing. So, um, so um, the way we're gonna do this is that we are gonna create a small uh, block here, which is gonna be 16 uh, bytes long. And it's gonna start with the command that we want to execute. And then uh, we can just fill out with some common characters. We need to make sure that this is exactly 16 um, bytes. And then we're going to use this um, force uh, CRC tool to modify this uh, slightly uh, to include the um, um, like the uh, so that it's modified slightly so that it um, the CRC of this block becomes what it, what we want it to be. So we're going to put these 16 bytes into just a small file. We're going to stick it in here. Um, and um, so we save that file. And we can run this code, which we should give a file name. And then we give it an offset where it can do the modification. So we don't want to touch these uh, characters. So we give it like nine as an offset should work. And we want the new CRC value to be. So can I do this in? Yeah, as a hex value without the prefix. Uh, so we want it to be 80 and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then, whoa. Uh, so if we look at this now, we can reload the file and we see that it's been slightly uh, modified. So we can take these uh, four bytes here, go back to uh, our original code here. Um, and let's just you know for clarity not put them as like random bytes but we take the um the value so we'll just take the unsigned int value uh here and then 
and here we're just I'm just gonna make sure I didn't mess up so this should be 16 bytes exactly so now let's start the exploit uh, and we're gonna see this happen I think it's nice to look at it in a debugger so in the main function we are I think this is where let's just correlate it with here it's yeah exactly so uh, should be no wait Uh, yeah so this should be this call here so let's put a breakpoint there main plus 461 continue oh shit there's the alarm thing so let's redo that but now with this newfound knowledge run it and we see it's breaking here at the call and it's gonna call into uh, this thing here so it didn't it seems it didn't work that's unfortunate where oh sorry it's we are I mean we're doing this multiple times also I messed up Oh yeah, it should be three of them at the end here. Oh, so there the exploit actually works. Uh, so that's basically it then. Um, let's try to run this against the remote server. So we have the original connect.sh script connecting to the pony racing challenge. Um, service so that we can just connect we see it's running let's take this um, put it into um, our script so we're just replacing instead of starting a local process we're connecting to a remote host and then we're running this and Something is not quite working, it seems. So maybe we, we got unlucky. Yeah, so we did get a bit unlucky. So let's see. Yes, we have hey, well done. a working exploit. Uh, and then if this would have been, I can, you know, submit the flag, type in my email address. And it says, congratulations, you have solved the community challenge. Um, and yeah. So does this mean that you're going to attempt to do a pony race? I, I can put you on the top of the list if you want. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I think I would like an invite to the next episode. That's, uh, <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah. So that's how you solve, uh, the first, uh, community challenge. And, uh, yeah. So I hope you, you learned something by. Uh, watching this and um, yeah we're going to continue making these uh, write-up videos about the community challenges that we release so even if you didn't solve it or if you solved it another way you can watch these and and, and learn and get better at uh, poning and please remember that we have a write-ups repository and we want to fill it up with all your solutions so if you have any solutions please uh, do a uh, what do they need to do? Uh, yeah, so they will need to go to this uh, GitHub repo and make a pull request with their solution for the relevant um, challenge. And uh, a link uh, to the repo will is available or will be available on the uh, our website pony .racing. And don't forget to tune in to the next episode.
Thanks. Thanks.